Well, Argentina won the World Cup and deservedly so after the greatest final ever played in the World Football Tournament. But actually, we all won. Nobody in their right mind, and there are some people not in their right mind, could say that they don't enjoy football at that level. The final was the most dramatic sporting encounter of all time, but it was the apogee of the greatest tournament of all time. So Qatar won the World Cup. Qatar won the World Cup despite the swirling, smearing, slanderous, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim prejudice that infused virtually every minute of the pre-football chat on every television station in the early stages of the World Cup. We know who were the losers. The losers were the virtue-signaling half-wits who were on the plane home before, you could say, the words Manchester Guardian. And yes, Germany, I mean you, but not only you. I mean you, I mean Denmark. To some extent, I mean England. All you rainbow warriors that tried to spoil the World Cup because of your faux, in most cases, liberal sensibilities. I say faux because you wouldn't turn down a check from Qatar, nor from its neighbours. You wouldn't turn down a check from anybody. And you won't breathe a word of criticism of the United States of America four years from now if you are, you are offered a check to be there. So Qatar won the World Cup. The virtue signalers were the losers. Morocco won the World Cup, becoming the first African, first Arab, first Muslim football team to reach the semi-final of the World Cup and win the hearts of a billion people, a billion people that were predisposed towards them. But actually, I think millions of people that were not, that had no idea that the Arabs could play football like that. So Morocco also won the World Cup. FIFA won the World Cup. If they had not granted the last World Cup to Russia and this World Cup to Qatar, they would have saved themselves a lot of trouble, you know. A lot of subversion, a lot of destabilization, a lot of slander, a lot of arrests, charge and convictions. They would have been left entirely alone if they had granted the World Cup as the big powers intended to the United States and England. Because they didn't and because they chose Russia, which hitherto was the best World Cup ever, and then Qatar, which now takes the prize, FIFA would be a very different organization today. So FIFA, hats off to you. But my more serious point is that this World Cup reflected the shift, the movement of the tectonic plates in the world, moving on the level of politics, on the level of economics, on the level of media reach and power, moving on the level of culture, moving on the level of sport. The old powers, the old colonial powers of France, of Germany, of Italy, of Belgium, and others, Spain, and others, Portugal, and others, have all gone home with their tails between their legs. And if you don't think that that is significant, you haven't been paying close enough attention. Sure, Argentina were also a colonizing country. Sure, France was filled with the people from the colonized countries. I'll let you in on a secret. I wanted France to win, and win they could have, even in the first 90 minutes, never mind with the rather poor penalties that they took and the rather poor goalkeeping of Hugo Lloris in the penalty shootout. Two of those penalties could have been saved by me, never mind the goalkeeper of the world champions as France were 
until a few moments ago. So it's all change. Is it all change on the Jack Kennedy story? Again, full disclosure. I loved Jack Kennedy. I was brought up in a house with his picture on the wall. He mattered to us. I could, as a child, recite well over half of his address, his inaugural address at the presidential inauguration. I wept in the street when my late father came out to tell me that the president had been killed that November night in 1963. But the next day, I already knew, although I wasn't even 10 years old, when I saw Jack Ruby murder the guy that murdered the president, I already smelled a rat. And I was nine years old. I knew there was something up about this, about whether or not Lee Harvey Oswald did commit that murder most foul. And if he did, how come a guy got into the garage of the police station and was able to shoot him dead at point blank range? And why would that man do that? Why would that man kill the man that killed the president when he himself hated the president? Even I could smell a conspiracy party and I was nine years old. Who was in that party? Well, first of all, anyone asking questions was branded for the first time in recorded English language in the media as a conspiracy theorist. The New York Times four times in 1964, branded those who thought the Warren Commission wasn't worth the paper it was written on, apart from all the redacted pages, apart from all the things that weren't even in the redacted pages, knew that it was a crock. We were the conspiracy theorists. I'm 10 years old by that time. And for the rest of my days, I have and will believed that Jack Kennedy was murdered in a conspiracy by the deep state of the United States of America. Furthermore, I've got to thinking, actually, since Bob Dylan's song, Murder Most Foul, that there has never been glad, confident mourning in America ever since. As Bob says, the Antichrist came in the door when LBJ was sworn in on board the presidential aircraft after the murder of Jack Kennedy. I have got to thinking that prior to the murder of Kennedy, most of the world could have sung along to the song, I want to be an American. But ever since the killing of Jack Kennedy, slowly but surely, people have fallen out of love with the United States of America. And that feeling was crystallized in what Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said this week about Tucker Carlson's newscast on Fox News on the day that these Papers were released, finally, by Joe Biden. Tucker Carlson, no political friend of mine on Fox News, not exactly my television station of choice, spoke more truth with greater clarity in five minutes than the entire media and political class in the United States has done in almost 60 years. Carlson made the point that America was murdered that day on Dealey Plaza in that nightmare on Elm Street in Dallas, Texas because the American public slowly but surely realized that their own state had killed their own president, had murdered 
This man so full of promise and vigor with his beautiful wife and his young children had murdered him, yes. Hard luck. Lots of people get murdered. But they murdered their republic. They murdered what remained of the American dream. Of course, they had committed many crimes before. And of course, they would go on to commit many worse crimes after and until this day. But few of their crimes were as significant as the one that took place in the murder most foul of Jack Kennedy. And something else died that day. It was the faith of the American people in their own government. And every day that has ensued, every one has vindicated that collapse, that death of faith in the state, in the American Republic. Until the situation we have today, when the United States of America is led by a blithering idiot who you wouldn't send out to buy a loaf but who's sitting there right now with the nuclear football at the foot of his desk that if he presses will bring about the end of all humanity. How serious is that? A congress of people on the make, of people insider trading, of people engaged in corrupt practices of all kinds, Two political parties, virtually as toxic as each other, completely ruling the roost and continuing to try and rule the world. What's happening in Ukraine is an American war. Almost everyone can see that now. We've got a poll running. Are you ready to die for Ukraine? Thousand, tens of thousands of people have voted. 92% of us are not ready to die for Ukraine. I wonder about the 8%. That's a lot of residents of Ward 5 in Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. Who are you? 8%. Call the show and explain how, why you are ready to die for Ukraine. It's an American war. Almost everyone can now see it. It wasn't unprovoked. Putin is not a maniac who woke up one morning and decided to attack his neighbor. This war has been in the making in Washington for years. And the European satrapies of the United States Empire, the vassals, like Macron, poor Mbappe, didn't just lose the World Cup final despite scoring a hat-trick. He had to endure Macron, hugging him, trying to console him at the end, adding insult to injury. These vassals, Macron, Johnson, Sunak, whoever it was that came in between them, little soldier Schultz, and the people whose names we don't even know, that are the vassals in most of the European countries. They're not making any decisions. If they were, their own economies wouldn't be being visibly destroyed in front of the eyes of their people. These decisions are being made by that blithering idiot in Washington. How far down we've come. From Jack Kennedy, who diffused the Cuban missile crisis by intelligence and diplomacy to the blithering idiot Joe Biden who has dragged us all to the cusp of war because that poll question is not an academic one. You even though you voted in overwhelming numbers that you were not ready to die for Ukraine might still have to die for Ukraine. Make no mistake about this. 
The world has never been closer to a nuclear catastrophe than it is right now. The Russians are deploying their nuclear weapons right now, showing it on television. They're openly discussing changing their nuclear doctrine, hitherto setting their face against any first use of nuclear weapons. Why are they doing this? Because they can see that the NATO countries, including yours, are determined upon war after war after war after war and that they will never stop until they have succeeded or died, succeeded in their mission to regime change Russia, to divide it, break it up, balkanize it, like they did with Yugoslavia, steal its resources, steal its oil, its gas, its gold, its nickel, all of its precious metals, all of its timber, all of its ore, all of its land, the biggest country in the world, they will not stop until they have been stopped or they succeed. And China knows that she is next. China knows acutely that she is next. And so a situation has developed in the world almost Orwellian in its sweep of permanent war stretched out before us for the rest of our lives and even the lives of our children should they survive this period of permanent war. War for resources, war for power, war for riches, war for hegemony, dominance, war for direction of international events and the control of other people's national sovereignty. That's the future that Russia can see, which is why these great missiles of theirs that could land almost in an instant on any European capital and not very much later on any American city are now there, pictured for the first time, bristling with defiance. This is not our war, and yet Britain is deeply involved in it. Its soldiers are deeply involved in it. Its treasury is funding it. Its politicians are seeking and helping to direct it. Our special forces have now admitted that they're actually fighting in the war. None of us agreed to this. None of us were asked to agree to it. Even the puppet parliament in London was not trusted to be asked for this involvement. Britain, after the United States, is the number one villain in this picture. And so if the shooting starts, if the nuclear weapons begin to fly, be sure that they'll land on London, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Glasgow, before anywhere else. Our leaders have made us amongst the most hated of countries in the world. We don't like to say it, we don't like to hear it, but it's true. The United States, once loved, admired, copied, emulated, is now the most hated country in the world. The tectonic plates have shifted not just in Qatar this evening in the World Cup final. They are shifting volubly, visibly, on every level.
because it's now a race against time. Can the world change before it is destroyed? It's going to be a bumpy night. I need your calls. 760,000 people watched last Sunday's show, which in a time of the World Cup is frankly astounding and certainly not a number that can be compared with any current affairs show of its kind anywhere in the world. But people are recovering breathlessly from what we've just watched. And therefore you have a chance to get your phone call in and on air in a way that you never have before. Our numbers are appearing on your screen now. I need your calls. They're entirely free from the US, from Canada, from Britain, from Ireland. You can call us from anywhere in the world and we'll call you back and put you on the air. But first up, after this short break, it's the indefatigable English journalist, Johnny Miller, in the Ukraine. 